One thing that I've really tried to press upon the class so far is the intersection of industrialization, urbanization, and immigration. Not only are those three things intersected, as you're going to come to find out, in, in many ways one gives rise to the other. Let me explain. Um, we know that industrial, uh, the Industrial Revolution really changes life in America profoundly in the late 19th century. And we also know that a lot of these industries begin to flock to the cities. Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, those areas. The reason that they're coming to the cities involves, generally, the fact that it's cheaper to do business there. The reason that it's cheaper to do business is because these cities have big populations, lots of people, and so that means that you have lots of options when it comes to your workers. You're not going to pay as much in Chicago as you are in rural Virginia when it comes to your labor costs. And it's also easier and cheaper to ship your products around if you're in the railroad capital of the country, Chicago. And it's not a coincidence whatsoever that when immigrants arrive on American shores, they head to the cities. An example from our readings, um, our good friend Jurgis Rudkus, when he arrives to America, he knows one word in the English language, and that's Chicago. He doesn't really mean like Navy Pier or the Cubs or anything like that. What, what he really means is I want a job and I know that there are jobs in Chicago because there's factories in Chicago, right? This was not a secret in Eastern Europe. It was not a secret in Eastern Asia for that matter. And when immigrants arrived, they, they generally headed to the cities because they knew that that's where the jobs were. So as you can see, many of these things are deeply interconnected here. You've got industrialization that's headed toward the cities because it's cheaper to do business. You've got the cities becoming huge, which is going to make it even more attractive for the industries. You've got immigrants that are being drawn like magnets to the cities because that's where they know that industry likes to concentrate. This is how these things are interconnected in the late 19th century. Um, urbanization, all I really mean by that is the rapid development of cities, and that's what you begin to see very significantly in the late 19th century, and that's what we're going to talk about for a good chunk of the lecture here today. Now, one thing I want to mention before we move forward is that um, urbanization, urban living, would not have been possible had it not been for the advancement of technology. Um, things become very complicated in the late 19th century. For most of the 1800s, cities were referred to as walking cities because it took you approximately 20 minutes to walk across any city. Now, I don't care if you're talking about a big city or a small city today, there's no way that you're doing that. And the reason is urban sprawl, traffic, hustle bustle, all that good stuff, right? Well, that really began to become a thing in, in, in the late 19th century. Fortunately, we have the invention of electricity. And what electricity allows factory owners to do is to bring their, their, their workers to the factories from where they live using the electric trolley. Again, you see this in the jungle. But what the trolley does is it moves people from where they live to where they work and then back from where they work to where they live. And you're able to effectively get from one point in the city to the next. Similarly, electricity turns night into day, and it allows factory owners like Andrew Carnegie to keep their shops running morning, noon, and night. And so as you can see, guys, technology is a very important part of urbanization. Without it, there's a good chance that we can't do some of the things that we're seeing being done. But I don't want to over-romanticize this. Living in the city is hard, hard business, and there's just no two ways about it. The cities were overcrowded, right? People living on top of each other. And if that's not bad enough, you don't have any health codes. I want you to look at the bottom of the screen there if you're following along in the PowerPoint slide with me. Those are tenements, and not only are there a lot of people packed into those one-bedroom apartments, there's nothing to say that you can't pack 12, 13, 14 people into a one-bedroom apartment. There's no such thing as public health codes. Now, obviously, this gives rise to issues like fire hazards, but just think about somebody bringing something like a common cold into those tenements. What's going to happen when, when those germs begin to spread first to the one bedroom and then to the rest of the complex? 
It's going to spread like wildfire. And so this is what I'm talking about when it comes to the dangers of living within the cities. It's not as if city officials just don't want to respond. Um, some of them do. It's just that these things are becoming huge, complicated, complex matters before they can really effectively get out in front of them. One exception, though, would be an architect, a guy by the name of Frederick Law Olmsted, um, who I bet you know, even if you don't know, you know him. Olmsted is the guy that's going to design Central Park in New York. And if you know anything about Central Park, it's this droplet of green in an otherwise concrete jungle. And that was by design. Olmsted had always considered Americans as a great pioneering race. We had hacked a civilization out of uh, the wilderness, and he felt that, uh, that was, it was a tragedy that we were beginning to lose our great wilderness roots. And so when, did, when he designed Central Park, he designed it with a place in mind where New Yorkers could go and get some recreation, escape the pollution, the hustle and bustle, um, walk, uh, sit next to a pond, that sort of thing, right? But as I said before, cities are dangerous places to, to live. And one of the biggest reasons is there's, there's no rules or regulations for what you can do when it comes to cranking out pollution into the streets. Um, I don't mean to be too graphic, but it wouldn't have been anything whatsoever to see standing raw sewage in the streets of Chicago on any given occasion. Um, as I indicated a little bit ago, um, the cities are pretty much comprised of people of immigrant stock. Now, immigration is something that's very, in, very emblematic to the American experience. It's very episodic, but it's something we've certainly seen in this, in, in this um, uh, early American history class before. It does tend to come in waves, right? And the wave that came heretofore was, was generally from places like Ireland and Germany. And that wave really began in the 1840s, accelerated in the 1850s, and then, then the Irish and the Germans became acculturated and, I guess you might say, became American, right? Were absorbed by the broader population. This new wave of immigration, at least for cities like New York, Chicago, Boston, are coming from different parts of Europe. They're coming from Southern Europe. They're coming from Eastern Europe. And those are people that don't look like prototypical Americans. They don't speak English. Um, they eat different sorts of foods. They have different religions. Maybe most importantly, they have different customs. Um, we live in a society, modern day society, where men don't really touch each other aside from shaking hands. But the Italians thought nothing of, of, of a man coming up and giving another man a kiss on the cheek. And so as you can, might be able to see here, there's a little bit of culture shock going on when you see this wave of immigrants coming over that is serving to redefine American demographics. But why are they coming over? Well, long story short, they're coming for the same reasons that people have always come to America. They're coming for opportunity, right? Opportunity that involves economic opportunity. There are jobs in those factories. And some people, like those that are coming from Italy, um, had the intention of coming over, getting a job in the construction industry, getting a job in any industry, making money, and then taking that money back to Italy and buying a farm. Many of these people had been pushed off their land in Italy based on what was going on there, not just there, but especially there at the time. And the idea was make money in America, bring it back, and buy, a land, or buy some land in Italy and call it a day, right? You have other individuals that are coming for what might best be called social opportunity. At this particular time period, many European Jews are treated as second-class citizens, not, not just in the places that you might think, but really all throughout Eastern Europe. And they're coming to America because they know that there's no official state religion, and for the most part, people will allow you to practice whatever religion you choose, and they're pretty much going to keep out of your business when it comes to that. They're also being pushed out, right? They're being pushed out through war, through famine, through, you know, a changing economy in, in different parts of Europe. And this, this process of being pulled in by opportunities and being pushed out by these other extenuating factors, um, it's serving to really, really 
produce a wave of immigration in the late 19th century. It's not as if we have an open door policy. When these steamships full of immigrants come from Europe, many of them, most of them, are processed at this checkpoint that we call Ellis Island. For your notes, what Ellis Island is, is the checkpoint where we're processing millions and millions of new Americans. If you're following along with me, you're looking at a picture of Ellis Island at the bottom of that screen in the registry room there in its main hall. And if you ever get a chance, I highly encourage you to go take a look at it. It's now a national park, so you can do so for, for relatively cheap. But in any case, you're packing up your entire life and you're going into this new world, this brand new experience. And by the time that you get to that front of that line, there's a guy there that doesn't speak your language that's asking you all these probing questions. Who are you? Where do you come from? Do you have a job? Do you have a place to stay? We do not want you to become vagrants. My point is that immigration was nothing short of a traumatic experience. It wasn't as if we just flung open the doors and everybody just waltzed in. There's a lot of hoops to jump through, and Ellis Island certainly demonstrates that, that point nicely. Once they make their way through Ellis Island, um, they do tend to concentrate themselves, not only in cities, but in ethnic communities, um, what is loosely called ghettos throughout the cities. We've got a very different modern-day definition of the term ghetto, but what you really mean when you say that is a homogeneous concentration of people. Um, Mulberry Street, or what would be the greater Mulberry Street region in New York, that, that was Little Italy. That was the concentration of Italian immigrants. In Detroit, I know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but uh, the south and the eastern sides of the cities would come to be home to thousands and thousands of African Americans, and it was nicknamed Black Bottom, South Detroit, uh, because the massive concentration of African Americans in that part of the city. That's what I mean when I say ghettoization. This is actually going to assist in the process that I'll call the assimilation, acculturation process as well, though. To give you a better idea as to what I'm talking about, I want you to take a look at that screen right there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. All of these images were taken in the United States, but I don't know that there'd be too many of you that would fight me that hard if I said that this image that I'm mousing over right here that comes from, you know, a village in Italy or this image that I'm pointing to up here that, that's coming from Poland. Um, those are actually both taken in New York. Uh, the bottom left image is Mulberry Street, the Italian district, and the uh, upper right image, that's Hester Street, the heart of the Jewish community. But as you can see, there are push carts, there are people out, it's market day. Uh, what those individuals are doing is they're taking something that's quite familiar to them, um, selling products of their homeland, generally to people from their homeland, and they're using it to kind of ease their way into the American experience. This church right here, right? This is uh, the Sweetest Heart of Mary Church in Detroit. Um, and I told you it's from Detroit, but and again, I don't know that there'd be too many of you that if I said that that was Warsaw, Poland, that people would say absolutely not. There's no way that that could be Warsaw because it's got a very old world look to it. It's because it was built by Polish immigrants around this time period in the city of Detroit, which was home to thousands and thousands of people of Polish ancestry. This image over here, now I know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves in terms of the chronology, that's a jazz band. Those are African-American jazz musicians. And if you know anything about jazz, you know it's not uh, indigenous to the north, even though the Cotton Club and some of the better jazz clubs are located in the north. Uh, that was something that African-American transplants brought with them, and it helps them to um, acculturate, assimilate themselves into American life. One of my favorite images on this screen here is this one right here. These are two garment worker girls that are marching in a Labor Day parade. Now you can see the sash on the one on the right there. It says abolish, you can't really see the wage slavery, but it says abolish wage slavery. 
Uh, to her left, you see a girl wearing a sash, and you guessed it. You don't even have to read Hebrew to get this. It says abolish wage slavery, right? It's a way of taking something that's familiar to you and really using that to immerse yourself in your new surroundings. And this process, it, it really was a process, helped to acculturate millions and millions of new Americans, right? Now... Again, I, I, I really want to keep us grounded in the reality of the situation, similar to the dangers of living in the city. Uh, not everybody is really super happy to see these people coming. At this point in the class, I'm hopeful that you know that xenophobia is this fear of others, fear of people that are coming from other countries. Maybe more simply put, it's a fear of foreigners, right? And there's a lot of people that fear this process. In, in, in labor circles, there are people that worry that they're going to drag down the price of labor. Uh, they will de-skill the process. That's going to be a problem. And then you get people that are just infinitely worse, m much like the individual that you're looking at on the screen there. That's a guy by the name of F. Prescott Hall who's going to be instrumental, very important, in the foundation of what will later become known as the Immigration Restriction League. As you might imagine, what these individuals that make up the league, what they want Congress to do is to shut down immigration altogether. But not for the reasons that you might think. At this particular moment, there's a pseudoscience movement that's really sweeping really the world, but especially the United States. It's known as eugenics. And what eugenics argued was that there was a hierarchy to mankind. Not all people were created equal that there was a structure to humankind involving race. And predictably, and I should probably use air quotes, uh, predictably, because it's certainly not my thought, but there, uh, on top of this were people from the British Isles, Anglos, right? Uh, they were the people that had come over much earlier, they controlled much of the infrastructure now, and it emphasized that they were, you know, the superior race and everybody underneath them, especially those individuals that are coming to the United States from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe. You'll see this later when the Chinese start coming, when the Japanese start coming. They were an inferior race. Eugenics dovetails with this other philosophy known as social Darwinism, which emphasized based on the teachings of Charles Darwin and evolution, that human beings were, were also evolving as well. And the Anglo race, according to this line of thinking, the Anglo race had evolved, and the problem with that is if you allow just millions and millions of these newcomers, um, all of whom, or just about most of whom, people like F. Prescott Hall consider to be inferior, if you just opened up your doors, what they're going to do is intermarry with the native-born Anglo-based population, which would, in his mind anyway, would involve a deterioration of the American race, right? What that would do was it would poison, in his mind, this great Anglo gene pool, and it would compromise the United States. They're not going to succeed in the late 19th century, but if you stay with us for long enough, you're going to see immigration basically shut down altogether, right? Um, in 1924, you get something called the Immigration Act, which, as you're going to find out, uh, does a pretty good job of shutting off immigration from these origins. But for right now, I want to talk about one of the only institutions that is really kind of going to bat for these newcomers, and that would be political machines. Okay. Before we go any further, I need you to understand that a political machine is not, not an engine, it's not a machine at all, and I'm not trying to be cute. What I want you to write down is that a political machine is a relationship. It's a political relationship where you, the voter, you trade me, the politician, your vote. I get your vote. I get elected. I get to stay four more years, and I get to do what I'm doing. What you get would be a political favor, okay? Um, if you help me get elected, I will find you a job, maybe a job working for me. If you help me get elected, I will get you that license that you need to sell fruit in the city. In other words, I will give you something that you want that politics and politicians can grant for you. That's what I mean. Now, of course, this is not a very healthy relationship. And people, like the individual that you're looking at on the screen there, they, they, they knew that it was corrupt. 
Um, if you know anything about American history, you can tell me that that's uh, the most famous political boss in American history, a guy from New York by the name of William Boss Tweed, who ran this organization known as Tammany Hall, arguably the most famous or infamous, however you want to look at it, uh, political machine in American history, right? And what he used to say was, yes, it's corrupt, but it's honest boodle. And today, I think we'd call that inside information. Um, it was a job perk as far as he was concerned, right? What this really amounted to was a situation where I have some inside information and I'm going to use that information to make myself money. But as long as I'm coming to work and I'm serving the people, then who cares? It doesn't matter. It's not that big of a deal, right? But I will say this about your political machines. They're the only people really that's paying any attention whatsoever to the needs and, and, and the desires of these immigrants living in the cities, People of the national variety aren't paying any attention. People of the state variety, they're not paying any attention. It's your local politician because he wants their votes. He's asking the people, what do you need? What can we do for you? What kind of services are essential for you? And yes, they're doing so for very corrupt reasons, but they're doing so. And it is serving, at least in part, serving the needs of these individuals. It's much more complicated than I'm making it out to be right here, but I do think that you can say that these political machines were generally serving the interests of people of the foreign-born variety. Now, I'll end our class by talking about the culture that will emerge as a result of these newcomers. Throughout most of the 19th century, America subscribed to what might best be called the Victorian era culture, right? Everything that was culture, broadly defined, had to have some sort of uplifting, valuable spirit to it, right? It couldn't just be fun for the sake of fun. And in 1892, the United States was celebrating Columbus's um, 400th so-called discovery of the Americas. And in Chicago, there was this thing called the Columbian Exposition. And what it was designed to do was to glorify Western life, Western thought, Western architecture, uh, Western art, broadly defined. You're looking at two images there of what came to be known as the White City, part of the exhibit in the Columbian ex uh, Exposition. This was put on primarily by our good friend, um, Frederick Law Olmsted, but the problem was he noticed a lot of people were leaving and they were leaving early. You might be into art, you might not, but if you're like me, you've got one good solid afternoon in you when it comes to going to the museum, right? I've got one good solid day and I don't really have very much thereafter, right? In other words, I get bored, I get distracted, and that's, I think, what was happening to these people, right? They began to leave, and, and, and Olmsted saw that as a slap in the face, and so what he begins to do is he begins to design ways to keep people there. One way that he came up with is what he called the midway. You and I would call that a carnival. All kinds of sideshows, all kinds of, shall we say, dangerous pastimes that were interesting, right? It wasn't art for the sake of uplifting. It was fun for the sake of having fun. And there was always this slight chance that you might have a little bit of trouble that comes along with it. So the Midway helps Olmsted do what he wants to do, which is keep people where they currently are. But it also gives a guy back in New York a good idea. A businessman by the name of George C. Tilliard began to market these dangerous pastimes, okay? I'll get back to that in a second, but I need you to understand that without industrialization, you're not going to have the marketability of what you and I would call leisure, right? Downtime, stuff that you're doing for fun. You now have predictable work rhythms in your day-to-day -day life. You're on the clock at 9, you're off at 6, and from what you do from 6 forward, that's your business. Well, Till you understands that when people check out, what they want to do is just kind of decompress. They don't want to go to, you know, the Museum of Modern Art or the Kimball Museum in Fort Worth. What they want to do is really unwind. And so he begins to market things on this little um, part of Brooklyn that he owns that have a very dangerous tinge to them. Probably not what you're thinking. He improves the beaches, right? And he makes them into swimmable sort of 
parts of Brooklyn. And he encourages people to come and to swim in the ocean. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is he encouraged them to come in, in, in these new emerging bathing suits. And that was the dangerous part, right? Let me show you. Look at that image there. And I'm sorry about the quality of that image. That's about the best one that I could find. That would have been considered a very risque bathing suit by the standards of the late 19th century. Now, if you look at that image, right, look at those ladies. They're very aware that there's a camera pointed at them, and they're almost kind of flaunting it, right? They're, they're, they're kind of celebrating that they're not supposed to be doing stuff like this, right? They're posing for it, and they're doing so in a pretty provocative way, or at least what that was provocative for them at the time, okay? Till you understood that, and he also understood that people liked thinking that they were getting away with something. This became defying the social norms. Uh, Victorian era America says you shouldn't do that. I say if it feels good, then do it, right? And he's making a lot of money. Later on, he's going to expand upon the beaches, and he'll add things like uh, petting zoos. Um, he'll end, uh, um, add things like Nickelodeons, uh, pre-film movies, sort of uh, uh, pop, a da, uh, pop a nickel into the little slot and watch a very short, very brief movie. Later on, finally, he, he would add what you're looking at there on the screen, and that would be roller coasters. He would call this idea Coney Island. And what Coney Island really is going to amount to is America's first amusement park. Um, when it comes to rail roller coasters, we had that technology for decades. I mean, miners had been going down in shafts to mine coal and other things for, for years and years until you just took that and you applied it to the concept of leisure. But similar to the, 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 the beaches issue, this was something that you weren't supposed to do. You were defying gravity. You were cheating death, and you were getting away with it, and that's what made it fun. And that's the marketing ploy that Till you use when it comes to Coney Island. But Coney Island was looked upon not only suspiciously, but very, very contemptuously by by the, the powers that be in Victoria era America. Um, these cheap amusements were the problem. The problem was you had these middle class guys that were treating these working class girls to admissions and then what they expected was well some sort of favor in return. Not what you're thinking, right? Ride the tunnel of love with me, right? Anything can happen in the tunnel of love. And that's what Victorian era Americans really worried about, that the mixing of these sexes, which had an unmistakable class dynamic to it, that could lead to trouble. If these ladies were on the hook, so to speak, for being treated, then, then the not, not good things are going to come from that. But what I want to leave you with is this. In addition to the work rhythms... Coney Island would not have been possible had it not been for this changing ethnic demographic in American life. Many of these people that are coming over, they're, they're not Protestant, they're Catholic. Some of them are Jewish, and they've got a very different understanding of what the Sabbath is and when it is and the role that alcohol plays in, in, in your life and what's permissible and what's not. They have a very different culture, as, as I pointed out earlier in this lecture. And people like Till you understand that on the one hand, they've got downtime and a little bit of money to spend. And on the other hand, th this is an opportunity that didn't really exist before they showed up. Because most Americans of that variety looked upon this as something that had to be good and uplifting, it's a new game. And so it's the changing ethnic demographics that will give rise to what you call a new national culture. We'll pick it up there the next time.